Well, greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. Uh, we have, uh, we, we used to call it open phones, but it's not really, not even using a phone line anymore. I don't know what it is. It's, I don't know. I miss phones. <laughs> I, I miss having 877-753-3321, I think was the number. Um, something like that. Uh, you can hang up on people. You really can't. All you can do now is just disconnect. It's not nearly as fun as hanging up on people um, and being hung up upon. There was something final about <laughs> about being hung up on, I guess. I don't know. But we're taking your calls. Uh, we'll get to them in just a second. Um, I, I didn't really dive into it. I'm not going to really dive into it right now, um, though this would be the safest time to do so. But you've all heard it. You're hearing it on all sorts of social media platforms and news outlets, uh, the coming mask mandates. Now, for a while, I would repost or retweet studies especially after the Musk takeover, um, the studies that I had been collecting and that would, were coming out demonstrating that the lockdowns did nothing to mitigate the spread of the virus, that if you did not have multiple uh, comorbidities, if you were a healthy young person, there was absolutely nothing for you to worry about. It was, it was no more dangerous than the seasonal flu was. Um, studies have demonstrated that the forced uh, medical procedures and the drugs that were used um, to treat people, the speed with which people were put on ventilators, that that was the primary reason for the, the deaths in older people, that it was the protocol that killed people, not the virus. Um and so as, as the studies started coming out in 2022, um, I would, I started collecting them, figuring someday this is, it's going to come back again. I knew that the reason that, you know, the mask mandates finally went away and stopped talking about getting everybody inoculated, even though they continued to push that kind of stuff. Um, that it was it was burnout. It was we need to shift people's attention away from this for a while to bring it back again, to make it work again. It only works for a certain period of time, so let's do climate panic for now, and um, reconsolidate our position, come up with a new variant, and then we'll be back and we'll see how much farther we can push this. And that's what I've been saying all along. Um, I've said it repeatedly, and I've been living in light of that. Um, a lot of folks look at me and they go, you know, it'd be a lot easier if you'd get to G3 if you flew. Um, and that's true. It uh, it would be. Uh, what? Why? Well, yeah. Um, I, I have no fear of flying. I flew 165,000 miles in 2019. I visited Russia and Ukraine and South Africa and Australia. Spent like two months in London. Um, I obviously don't have any problems with uh, that methodology of transport. But we had made the decision. Uh, part of it was just simply, you know, Ministry, for example, on this trip uh, coming up September 5th, I leave September 5th. A few days into that, I'll be stopping in Amarillo. And I've stopped in Amarillo many times. I know the KOA there, like the back of my hand. I know the road's going to it, the road's coming from it. And though, ironically, I've never bought anything in their store, which is very strange. It's a nice store. Um, but now I'm making contact with churches in Amarillo. So I'll actually be speaking one of the nights that I'm in Amarillo on my way all the way to Pennsylvania 
uh, for the debate with Dr. Gregory Coles. Um, the more I'm getting into this, the more um, excited I am about the topic and the impact that hopefully it will be able to have long term in regards to how the church responds to the gay Christian movement, the gay celibate Christian movement, which is still dependent upon fundamental definitions of identity. Um, and honestly, I think a fundamental denial that 1 Corinthians 6, 11 really has validity. But we won't get into that right now. Anyways, um, point being, I mentioned to um, Daryl, who posted on Twitter yesterday, and he had a lot of people come back after him about this. He said, if they if they put the mask mandates back on, I'm canceling my flying travel. I'll find another way to get there. And, you know, my response was, <laughs> I actually, for the first time, sent a picture of my rig. Um, and I said, welcome to my world. <laughs> Guys, uh, if you need, if you need any advice, uh, if you need to know something about uh, Grand Design, Jayco, uh, KOAs, Good Sam, tires, hitches, uh, solar panels, um, you you name it, been there, done that. I'm at I'm at around forty thousand miles of RV pulling now, and uh, we can we can tell you what works and what doesn't. Uh, why you need a diesel, not a gas powered engine which I didn't know. I did not know. I had never owned a diesel. I did not know going down a hill, a diesel is going to give you significantly more engine braking power than a gas engine possibly can even pretend to. Who Who's going to know that unless you... Rich didn't know that. All Rich had ever pulled was a boat. <laughs> That's not nearly as heavy as my 10,000 pound um, fifth wheel. So... Anyway, all of that to say, if y'all need some need some advice, let me know. Um, but the the fact is, nothing has changed. In fact, things have gotten worse, not better, as far as who's in charge, with the with the steal of elections, both big ones and <sighs> midterms. Um, and they need to have mail in ballots. They that's how they do it. That's how they stuff the ballot boxes. You you watch, you saw the mules. You you watch with your own eyes people going from place to place to place, stuffing boxes with ballots. You saw it. And yet people just ignore it. Like, well, I don't know. You know, maybe it just has a big family. And oh, come on. Give me a break. Uh, nothing's changed. They were just they were just consolidating their position and they're back and they're it's all they've got. Keep people panicked and try to establish tyranny as quickly as possible while people are panicked. And man, I'll tell you, I still see people wearing masks outdoors in the heat in Phoenix <laughs> where, where, where any coronavirus that escaped from someone's mouth would be zapped by ultraviolet radiation in three seconds. Just, poof, gone. Um, but they're still out there and it's sad and they will submit. And as long as they submit and then other people give in and submit. And here in Phoenix, we're going to have some real challenges. We had a rhino Republican governor in 2020, 2021. Now we have, we don't have a governor. We have a fake Katie Hobbs, um, oversaw her own election. <laughs> the, the corruption in Maricopa County and the corruption in Arizona I don't know how we've made Chicago look like uh, a, a, a place where things are done right, but we have, and so we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have lockdowns like I don't know what once they, they we're gonna be like California, and um, we're not closing down our church. So uh, you see the mug shots of all the attorneys, you know. Uh, by the way, that is just such a 
it's astonishing to me. You do realize this is straight out of the Marxist, Leninist, Maoist playbook, right? You elect, you, you go after any attorneys that would dare to defend someone that the state doesn't like. That way they can't get representation. You keep everybody going the same direction that way. And the, that picture you saw from Georgia should make you scream um, or weep in sorrow for the end of a constitutional republic because it's... It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing what's going on out there. So anyway, yep, here we go. Um, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. I'm looking at the ATEM over here. We have an ATEM Mini Pro, and this is the this is the one that will that goes with me, right? Okay. So here's the yeah. You can sort of see the a ATEM. You can you know, there 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 she is. She's not. I wonder why she's not on. I mean, doesn't need to be on, but. I, I, that's what I figured because the power thing's plugged in and when it's in the unit, that's how you turn it on and off is, is, oh uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Gotcha. And that'll be going with me. And, uh, that's how we'll be running stuff here just in a matter of weeks. Uh, we've been getting work done on the truck and we got word today. I need to go pick up, uh, the RV tomorrow and get her parked again. Um, That'll be fun. <laughs> Back, backing a 35 foot long unit into a very narrow space is um, always an enjoyable experience. I watch some of these professional truckers and my hat is off to you. That one guy where he takes a truck and he gets it into that, that, that one spot. Have you seen that one? Astonishing. I mean, hats off. There is skills. There is skills. I don't have those skills, so I just do it very slowly and very carefully. And I've not damaged it ever, and I want to keep that that record. All right. All right. We've enough talking on my part. Let's, uh, we've got, I don't know where these calls are coming from. And there ain't, no, how many you got? Two, four, six, eight, nine? Okay, Nine. So we will see. Just so everybody knows, if you're still trying to get in, I just locked the room. We have okay. more than enough callers than we can handle. Yeah, nine is, yeah. Um, probably not going to get to those. All right, let's try. I will try to be brief uh, to try to get to May as possible. Let's talk to uh, Blake. Hi, Blake. Hey, Dr. White. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Um Yes, sir. And, uh, 11. Um, pretty much the the three main views that I know of have to do with like a conventional view that women need okay, to... Okay, did, 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 their... did something get lost there? Oh, am I okay, still I, th I think I think you cut off because no one knows what you're talking about. Oh, sorry. Hello. Uh, head coverings. First Corinthians 11. Can you hear me now? Uh-huh. Okay, fantastic. So, um... Essentially, I want to know what the correct view is and what your view is on these things. But I I also know at least like three different views. One of them is the conventional view. Women ought to have their hair covered. A different view where that was a sort of a local cultural concern. But then also a view that was popularized by Dr. Michael Heiser. As far as there was these first century uh, scientific theories that had this association between women's hair and sexually explicit things. Um, essentially, I, I want to know what your view on these different views are. But then also with that Dr. Michael Heiser view, I'm curious if that ends up being a legitimate view. How how do extra biblical studies like these, as far as like Greek science in the first century, like how, how do those sorts of things end up uh, informing our understanding of the sufficiency of scripture or how do we allow extra biblical historical scholarship to impact our doctrine, things like that. Uh, recently, uh, I was directed to that Heiser article. I didn't read it, so I can't really comment on it, but someone who had filled me in on, on the basics and said, while it's, it's fascinatingly argued that the only way you could actually hold it is if you were willing to promote the idea that the Apostle Paul was 
promoting scientific silliness as the basis of his exhortation to the church at Corinth. And uh, there are lots and lots and lots of New Testament scholars who wouldn't have any problem with that because they don't, they don't believe in the consistency of New Testament uh, books. They would believe Paul contradicted Paul. Paul could be wrong about this. Paul was, was wrong about that. And James was right about this. And so if you don't have a um, overriding uh, starting point that would reflect, for example, Jesus' own perspective on the nature of Scripture, when he quotes from the Psalms, David said, by the Holy Spirit, that much of New Testament scholarship just doesn't start there today. It's, it's very rationalistic along those lines. And so, as, as he had said uh, to me, and I, I'll go ahead and say it was Jeff Durbin. Um, Jeff said, he said, you know, it's fascinatingly argued, but it would require you to fundamentally abandon any meaningful view of Scripture as being uh, divine in its origin. Um, I, I know that Dr. Heiser passed away not too long ago, but I think most people who would put Heiser into especially the transcript bar now at aomin.org, uh, but even if you put it in the regular search engine, would see that uh, over the years, 99.9% uh, .9 of everything I've said about Dr. Heiser was negative. Negative in regards to his interpretation of Psalm 82, negative in regards to his exaltation of the uh, a &E, the Antonicene, Antonicene Fathers, <laughs> ancient Near Eastern text, um, and negative as to his anti-reformed stance as well, uh, which was really troubling because it sort of demonstrated a um, major area of uh, inaccuracy in his understanding of certain theological realities. But anyways, so as far as uh, that particular theory and perspective is concerned, yeah, the, the the, the people that would be willing to go that direction generally do not have either a functional or a confessional commitment to the idea um, that this is intended to be a consistent divine revelation. Not That does not mean that you're ignoring uh, the different kinds of literature. That does not mean that uh, you, you don't take into consideration uh, changes in language, for example. The, the Hebrew of, uh, of Moses is different than the Hebrew of Malachi because there's been a lot of evolution in language since the, between the two. Um, there's different context of, for the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. There, there's... That's primarily to the people of Israel. New Testament, it's it's for the world. Um, so there's contextual differences. There there is the question, a uh, vitally important question, of yeah, Corinth was a mess. I mean, religiously, it was like Salt Lake City, and so which which if you know anything about Salt Lake, it is a mess, uh, religiously, um, and so you have. A background to the questions that are being asked, because Paul's answering specific questions that have been sent to him. And so it's appropriate to uh, look at what would the Corinthians, what might have informed some of the questions they were having. So it's not wrong to go, well, there was this theory about um, hair and certain bodily fluids and things like that. Um, it's not Im improper to be aware of that. What is improper is to go, and Paul may have just believed it and just repeated it and uh, left us with a, a bunch of stuff that we keep copying today, but it's completely irrelevant to us. So uh, those, are, those are a lot of the issues that go into that last part of your, of your question. And that's why, and I've said this many times on the program, a person who believes in the sufficiency of scripture is in the small minority today. When we're talking about um, major uh, quote unquote Christian seminaries and denominations, if you believe in the 
sufficiency of Scripture. If you believe that God gave us exactly this and no more than this, and that he um, expended supernatural energy to bring it into existence, to preserve it, and to make sure that we know it, and that it took time for that to happen, but that we are able, not in a simplistic fashion, but in an appropriate fashion to uh, look at, all right, here's Genesis chapter 50, and then we're able to take what's in Genesis chapter 50, and it does have theological and revelational relevance to Jeremiah chapter 23, which, by the way, it does. I just happened to open it there. I'm putting the uh, um, these, uh, these ribbons back where they belong, having dyed the pages. Um, and then that has relevance as the background to Paul's teaching in, say, Romans 9 or Romans 11, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a canonical consistency and a canonical message. It's not simplistic. It's not what you have with IFB folks um, uh, saying, well, uh, when a word's used the first time, that's its definition throughout the Bible and all this kind of absurd silliness and numerology and all that kind of nutcasiness stuff. Uh, it comes from studying intertextuality, uh, the relationship between the Hebrew uh, Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, the relationship between the Greek translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. All these things are relevant and important, um, but they can't be taken to the point where they are taken by most people uh, to where you can simply go, ah, Paul contradicted Paul, Paul contradicted James. Nobody really understood what I, what uh, uh Ezekiel was saying, so they can do whatever they want with Ezekiel, this kind of stuff, which unfortunately fills a lot of the commentaries today. So back to the issue, the problem with 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is that it's, it's not just three um, different options. Uh, there are many. I recently read Gordon Fee's um, treatment of this in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. And I was struck once again with the fact that this is probably the most um, difficult text in the New Testament to be able to come to any kind of, when you say, what's the proper understanding? Well, <laughs> I have no earthly idea, and nobody nor, nor has anybody <laughs> else. Um, what, what needs to be recognized is that even when you dig into the text, and it says, for example, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying shames her head. Now, it starts off by talking, it uses the term kephale. Kephale means head. But the problem is, verse 3 uh, says uh, that Christ is the kephale of every man. And the man or the husband... Uh, do we translate aner as man, gunaikos as woman, or do we do husband and wife? What's the context here? But kephale is used there as well. And so Christ is the head of every man. Well, kephale, what is that? That's obviously not the same thing as head. And yet hair covering is using kephale in a physical sense and not just the metaphorical sense when it says Christ is the head of every man. So, Fee lays out all these different possible ways of going, okay, if we, if we understand head here in a literal sense, then we could take it this way, this way, and this way, but if it's meant in a metaphorical sense, then you gotta go this way, this way, this way, and there's permutations at each one. And there's so many complications. You know, when I was in seminary uh, and there was a discussion of this, I don't know why I remember it, but uh, the, the um, a very popular theory that you did sort of mention in passing was that because of the number of temple prostitutes and some source 
and I've read other sources say there's no evidence of this and other sources that repeat it, but some source says that the temple prostitutes shave their head, which would make sense. Um, and so if you have house churches, which is all you have, they're not building buildings at this point in time. If you see a bunch of women with shaved heads and it mentions shaved heads, um, in verse five. So if you have a bunch of women with shaved heads going into a certain house, what's that going to say to the entire culture around Corinth, which it wouldn't say in Ephesus or it might not say in numerous other cities. And so in seminary, the idea was, well, this is meant to make all the women the same so that it's not causing scandal to the church. And so it has specific reference. And so the application that we are to make is, and then you, you make application to whatever your situation might be in whatever culture you're in, that you're seeking, you're seeking to not bring reproach upon the name of Christ by simple fashions. A lot of reformed people have the, the truly reformed, um, and, and that's a, that's a phrase I use of reformed folks who believe you need to cross every T and dot every I, and therefore that there tends to be a focus by certain TR folks. That's not Texas Receptus has nothing to do with that at all. Truly reformed folks where you get a, a group of beliefs that end up coming together which include head coverings and exclusive psalmody, and sometimes no instruments in church. That's frequently connected to the exclusive psalmody uh, aspect too. And this becomes how you just, even though it doesn't represent where the reformers necessarily were in a number of areas, um, this is how you really become truly reformed. You're not really there until you do this. Uh, then there's another article I read recently that has a very fascinating, it's connected to um, uh, cessationism, to a reformed understanding of cessationism. And fundamentally, the, the theory behind it uh, was that what's going on in Corinth is not normative for the rest of the church because you have women praying and prophesying. Now, what, what the, the problem is here, are we talking about praying and prophesying only in the church? Or are we talking about it at all times? It seems that 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about in the gathering of the church. But you have, and I don't have the answer I, that, to, to all this. I just know where the, where the questions are. Um, you have other things that are addressed to the church as it's gathered together, but you have evidence of, well, women are to keep silent in the church. That's in 1 Corinthians. But then you have women prophesying in the church. You can't do that silently. So what's going on? So this other theory is that this was only during the apostolic period, and it's in fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel, where when the Spirit is poured out, your young men and young women will prophesy. And that this is to be connected together, which is also 1 Corinthians, with the signs that are being given to the people of Israel that the kingdom, in essence, has been taken away from them and given to the Gentiles. So the cessationist argument is tongues. I will speak to them in the tongues of other, other peoples, was meant that was meant to be in the mind of the Jew. Here is the prophecy: God's judgment is coming upon you, and the kingdom has been taken away. It's been given to someone else. And this understanding of head coverings says it's basically the same thing: that there was a period of time where you had this broader um, expression of spiritual gifts that included women, but only in two things. And this is what's weird. Because if you're into the head covering stuff, there's only two contexts in which it's said that the woman is to have her head covered while praying or prophesying. And of course, we think of our modern services and the you know women can be praying while you know during all sorts of parts of the service. No, it would seem to be what's being said is 
if the woman is leading in prayer and is prophesying to the group, preaching to the group, then she's to have her head covered. Well, none of the Reformed churches I know of have anybody doing that. So I don't know why anybody's covering their head, because that's the only thing that says they're supposed to, if you're doing that, then you cover your head. And Fee mentioned this, and other people talk about um, the, the fact that they're, and this is interesting, it might have modern application, that this was meant to not allow for a um, confusion of gender roles in the church. So the wife is not to be usurping her husband's position, so she wears that sign of authority when doing this. Otherwise, you end up with a destruction of the male-female roles that are clearly indicated in the page of Scripture, and the reason that this does not become normative later on is because of the cessationist argument, and hence, basically, after AD 70, isn't relevant anymore. Hmm. Um, no matter what you do, you do have to deal with the fact that the praying and the prophesying, how women doing that, okay? It, it's happening in Corinth. And so you have one book of the New Testament written to the most troubled book, uh, troubled church, of the New Testament that clearly has all sorts of background stuff that we don't have, that simply is not sufficient to establish some kind of universal, necessary New Testament observation that's not found in the old. There's no, there's, there's no fulfillment of law. There's no, that this wasn't something that existed in the old covenant and now it exists under the new covenant. There's a new covenant restriction along these lines that in regards to dress for women based on the most difficult text that we can know of in the New Testament. Um, that's always troubled me, to be perfectly honest with you. So there are some thoughts. Um, there, Like I said, there's entire books on the subject. I know lots of Reformed folks, but I'll be honest with you. Let me just be straightforward here. The vast majority, not all, they're, they're, Apologia had a period of time years ago where this became an issue. And basically, and I've, I've been informed, I wasn't there at the time, so I've been informed by my fellow pastors. Basically, they took the position of, look, we don't believe that this is something that... Uh, we can dogmatically demand that everybody do, but we respect your convictions on it. And if you want to do that, that's fine, but we have to live together. And we cannot have certain people basically saying to other people, you're not being spirit as spiritual as, as I am. So if you can do this without communicating that uh, to other people, great, fine. If that's your conviction, we're there. Uh, that that that's wonderful, and that's how we've tried to handle it ever since then. Here's my experience. Um, I have seen lots of smaller TR truly reformed, not Texas receptus, though that that tends to get connected too. To be perfectly honest with you, <laughs> um, but I have seen smaller TR truly reformed churches that have basically no outreach. Um, they're, they're not, they're not on Mill Avenue. They're not at the Macy Easter pageant. They're not at the general conference. Um, they're not at the abortion clinics and their growth comes from funneling people in from other reformed churches based on these issues, head coverings, Exclusive psalmody, uh, maybe the textual issue, that, that, that has been my experience too. So these non-definitional issues, you cannot make any of this definitional of the gospel. You can't make it definitional. You, you, you can't take a single letter with a very difficult, uh, ob obscure uh, discussion that, that, that admits of multiple different interpretations 
um, and say this is definitional for the entire church down through history. You just, you just can't go there, especially when it's something that is completely novel and new outside of anything from the Old Testament as well. Um, but that's how they get people. That's how they bring people in, is they get them convinced of this. They rarely talk about all the other options that are out there, uh, but say this is the way it needs to be done and convince people that that you'll be you'll be more reformed than Calvin was um, if you if you glom onto this and hold on to this. The problem is, okay, so you end up with everybody, all the ladies with their heads covered. That the excitement of that wears off eventually. <laughs> and um, you know, there's because it's not definitional. And you can say, well, we all feel good because we feel that we are demonstrating the, the proper relationship of men and women. Good. We need to be concerned about things like that. But I honestly think there are more uh, obvious and daily ways. Because I, I don't see how anybody can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and say that, that this has anything to do with being outside of the worship service itself and with specific application to praying and prophesying. That's sort of, you're stuck with. That's there. Um, so, yeah, I've seen this many, many times. And um, uh, if you are convinced, hey, I can be wrong about these things, but I'm, I'm simply saying you'd have to be convinced of one interpretation of probably more like a dozen rather than just three. And that means you'd also have to be convinced that the other 11 of them don't have any validity at all. Um, and if, but if you're convinced, then fine. Uh, we, we, I, I have no problem with a woman wearing head coverings, uh, in church. Um, but my experience is it never stops there. It always moves into the next level, which is, and if you don't, there's something wrong with you. And that's where yeah. the divisions start and the problems come in. So there you go. Yeah, I know. I know. We can go long today. It's no big deal. I don't know if any of that's helpful, but there you go. That was great. Thank you very much. Probably went way longer than you wanted. No, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Blake. Appreciate it. Okay, Tim, Hebrews 110. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Uh, so I just wanted to ask a question about Hebrews 110. I have been reading your book, uh, Forgotten Trinity, lately, and I find it uh, so, so wonderful and stuff like that. And I love your presentation on... Hebrews 10, and I did, I did find Jesus as Yahweh, but I was wondering if it would be appropriate, like, if I was wanting to reach out to someone who's, like, a cult member or something like that, I heard you mention that in Hebrews 1.10, he's quoting from Psalm 102, you, at the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, but uh, in Hebrews, he's quoting from the Greek text, which has the Greek word for Lord, which was the uh, original, what was the translation of Yahweh from the Hebrew text? Uh -huh. Do you think? Do you think in trying to talk with someone of a, another a false religion that that's something I should bring up, or is that? Feel well, free, to correct me if I'm. Uh, I don't know a lot of Greek, so feel free to tell me if I don't know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, well, um, it is fascinating to recognize that the New Testament writers. And, and there's people will give different numbers, but b between 85 and 95% of the time, they quote from the Greek Septuagint. And it's, it's very, very clear that whoever wrote Hebrews, and my personal theory is that Paul preached the message of Hebrews in Hebrew to Hebrew Christians, but it was written down for distribution outside of that narrow confine by Luke, the uh, syntax, grammar, uh, style of Hebrews is Luke-Acts. 
It's not Paul by any stretch of the imagination. Anyone, I can read Paul really, really well. Reading Hebrews, Acts, and Luke is a very different thing. It's not, uh, you know, I can read Paul and I can just live translate him because I, I know how he structures sentences and I'm accustomed to that. The sentence structure in Hebrews, Acts, and Luke, completely different. You have to be running down to the end of the line to find your verbs and stuff like that far more often than do with Paul. So my theory is um, this is Luke writing Paul's message. And if it's being distributed to Greek-speaking people, then what are you going to do? You're going to use the version of Scripture that is available for Greek-speaking people, which is the Greek Septuagint. And so... uh, it's, it's very clear that the writer to the Hebrews is doing this purposefully because there are places, there's one place in Hebrews 8, there's one place in Hebrews 10, where he quotes the Greek Septuagint even when it disagrees with the Hebrew Masoretic text and actually makes it part of his point. And so there's no question that the original author of Hebrews is using the Septuagint and wants the reader to be checking his citations against the Septuagint. And so that's what's been given to us in canonical scripture. There are obviously lengthy conversations to be had, which I've had with people many times uh, about exactly how that works. It's not what I would call a fundamentalistic view of inspiration and translation, but it's what we're presented in the New Testament. And so, yes, um, Psalm 102, 25, uh, 25, 27, quoted in Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, and then you have to back up. Uh, if you If you need to, you have to back up to verse 8, because verse 8 begins, prostaton huion, But to the Son, he says, and then Hebrews 1.10 begins with Kai, and he also says this to the Son. And so it is the writer's intention to say that these Old Testament texts are specifically being addressed to the Son. And so um, I have presented this to many Jehovah's Witnesses, their own Bible, will give the cross-reference in the center column or at the bottom of the page, depending on which printing they have, uh, that will direct them back to Psalm 102, 25 to 27. And um, so, uh, yes, most definitely, uh, because the writer to the Hebrews wants you to start there in your understanding of who Christ is, and that, just like the prologue of John, becomes the lens through which you are to be looking at everything else he says. So my answer is yes, use it. All right. That's really cool. Thank you so much, Brother James. Uh, God bless. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Okay, Nick, I hope, I hope we can do something meaningful here. What's up? Dr. White, pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Yes, sir. I spend time in the archives of the dividing line Um, there have been different things you've said as I've listened along, mostly tangentially about angels and demons. And so I, I wanted to see if you could flesh out a bit more kind of your views on the continued activity of angels and demons today. I mean, on the one hand, we we were just in Hebrews one verse 14 talks about how angels are ministering spirits sent to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Um, And while I know you've preached through Hebrews, I don't think I've listened to that sermon on Hebrews 114, although I've listened to several of the sermons that you've done on Hebrews. So on the one hand, kind of what are your views on the continued activity of angels on our behalf? And then on the other hand, what about the continued influence of demons in the world? And, And especially... I have in mind like demonic possession and things like that kind of what are your views on uh, the continued activities of angels and demons today 
Yeah. Um, well, I, I've i probably over the years uh, avoided the subject somewhat simply because of how much abuse there is of the topic in uh, a large portion of evangelicalism today. Um, and also just recognizing that there is a, a great deal of information on such terms as pharmakia in the New Testament that I haven't spent enough time on. There is, um, I know that, again, speaking of Jeff Durbin, he has uh, addressed a lot of these issues. We, um, you know, I, I can be straightforward. We encountered a tremendous amount of demonic activity in Hawaii and when we trying to plant a church in Kauai. Uh, incredible attacks upon those people that we sent out there. Uh, some of them are still dealing with things they went through when, when they were there. So um, I know Jeff has addressed it and... Um, one of our deacons, one of our deacons, and he's also then the other is a deacon of Apology of Utah. Um, I have a program called Cultish where they've addressed a lot of these issues to far more depth than than I would be able to comment on that you might find useful if you look that up. Um, but we tend to. Uh, I, I think there's. We, we're, we're seeing definitely that there is a tremendous connection between the spiritual realm and the physical realm and that part of that bridge is pharmakia um, from which we get pharmacy. So in other words, um, drugs, the opening up of the mind to spiritual influences through the use of drugs, um, the, 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 the amount of that today is astonishing the damage done to the human body and the human mind. We look at, uh, we, we see the videos, the sad videos in our major cities here in Phoenix, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, New York, of people who are burned out. Um, their, their minds are gone. They've, they've been uh, taken from them through uh, drug abuse. Um, or their lives through drugs like fentanyl, which are just just flowing through Arizona right now like a like a stream. We don't we don't have a southern border right now, um, and that's all purposeful, by the way. Anyway, um, there is a connection because here, you know, you destroy the mind and you destroy the the gateway through which truth can be delivered to someone. And again, I would refer people more to to Jeff on these things, because Jeff has extensive experience in dealing with drug rehabilitation and that the, the interaction uh, between that and the spiritual realm and the demonic. Obviously, there's a lot of silly, unbiblical stuff about angels you know, you can buy your little angel at your local Christian bookstore and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is they are, as it's described there in Hebrews 1, uh, ministering spirits um, that render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So there is a um, a concept of, of a secondary means and we're only given a few brief glimpses of what any of this would look like. We, we see uh, Peter being released from prison by an angel that has clear supernatural power. I mean, the angel is able to speak to Peter, open doors, and get him out of there without waking Roman soldiers up. That's pretty good. Um, that, that, that obviously indicates you know, true supernatural capacity. Um, but they are simply accomplishing the purpose of God. And I think they minister to us in ways that we don't generally see. We can be thankful for, 
we can recognize that God is using means to minister to us, but it doesn't mean we have to see these things or get all, um, you know, we, we, the, tendency, the, the tendency of mankind is to engage in idolatry. The Apostle John bows down to worship the angel that has shown him these things. And what does the angel have to say to him? Don't do that. Worship only God. So if, if John can do that, then you can see the, the danger that, that, that we are in. And that's, I think that's why we have limited insights given to us. And we need to be very, 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 very careful in coming to some of the conclusions that have been come to um, about what that ministry involves, what we can know about it, what our involvement with that can be. Um, I just, it just seems to me that there is a tendency on the part of a lot of Christians to overlook the really clear, direct teaching of scripture as to living our life and holiness and service to Christ. We look, we, we put all that aside and, ooh, let's talk about angels. Or, ooh, let's talk about demons. And we just have to take directly and literally what scripture says. Satan seeks those whom he may devour. You don't play with these types of things. You don't uh, pretend that you are uh, somehow the one person that's not going to be impacted by these things. But we also recognize that all of these spiritual beings are under God's sovereign control. So a lot of folks, especially folks that don't understand the sovereignty of God, they get into this stuff and it becomes this, well, I wonder who's going to win and uh, what can I do to help out and you know, this type of stuff rather than recognizing, hey, when you, when you obey the clear commands of Christ to love your wife and love your kids, you're smacking a demon in the, in the head uh, every time you do it. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't have to be these things that sell books. Uh, it has to be the things that actually demonstrate obedience and glorify Christ and, and things like that. Um, so that's a, that's a real brief commentary. Um, there's much more that needs to be said about that, but I, uh, without, without preparation and outline and stuff like that, just off the top of my head, uh, that's what I'd have to say. And like I said, um, I would be stunned if there isn't an episode of cultish where, uh, Jeff went on and talked about these things in significantly more depth than, uh, than I would. So I'd direct you that direction. All right. I, I know, I know I listened to one of the most recent episodes, uh, that apology did, and he did talk about, uh, some kind of experience he'd had three o'clock in the morning. It was the night before he was supposed to go and testify somewhere. Or yeah. Yeah. Make it, and, and so it definitely harrowing, but, uh, well, yeah, I Jeff, your time. Jeff is, um, Jeff is, experienced some amazing things both in the way of attack as well as in the way of miracle i mean he's told the story of his his son augustine and uh i was i had a very minor 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 part in all of that but i was one of the first people to hear about the complete healing of augustine um he was supposed to be born with spinal bifida they had the scans they they had the surgery suite ready they had the doctors standing by uh, Jeff had had uh, agreed that he he might have to catheterize his son for eighteen years, and he's already a grandfather for crying out loud. Um, and when that child was born, they're just turning him over, and <laughs> they're looking at the cats, they're looking at the scans, and they're looking at the baby, and and he called us the the elders, and he said, guys. Um, we're at the hospital. We were expecting to be here during all the surgeries. He's perfect. The, the, the ultrasound showed his spine outside of his body two days before the birth. And he's perfect. He's perfectly fine. He has no spinal bifida. So, um, yeah, 
Jeff has experienced some... I mean, I can... All of us can talk about spiritual experiences. One of the reasons I don't um, is because my spiritual experience can't necessarily communicate to anyone else. And there's already too much of that in the church today, where people are trying to live in light of what somebody else has experienced in a special spiritual way. Um, but I was just I was just having lunch um, with one of the co-founders of this ministry, Mike Bellavo. And I don't know if you remember this, Rich. I didn't remember this. This was this was something that if Mike told me about, I don't remember it, which isn't really sadly saying a whole lot anymore. But, and I hope he doesn't mind my telling the story since he just told it to me. But um, I experienced a lot of spiritual stuff in Salt Lake City. Okay, you're right there at the gates of darkness. And I saw some amazing things there. But Mike told me about early on, because <laughs> don't worry all those of you, we're going to get to you. Hold on, just hold on. Um, yeah, well, maybe no. Um, but uh, Mike and I went up to Salt Lake City in, I think it was May of 1984. We drove up in my 1964 Dodge Dart. No two body panels were the same color on the Dodge Dart. The floorboard was so worn out that there were holes in it. So we had to stop at the at Page, where the dam is, and dig through our luggage in the trunk to try to find some socks because the cold air was blowing through the holes in the floorboard on Mike's feet while he was driving. That's that's where we were. That's that we stayed at Motel Six. We we had nothing. Okay. And so I think it was probably that trip or one of those early trips. Mike was saying there, we had my tract, uh, Blood Atonement and the Mormon Church. I've still got some in a case somewhere in the other room, I would imagine. And he's standing there, there's this whole line of Mormons in front of him. And he's like, I need to say something to these people. No one's taking the track, so I need to say something to these people. And he says, all of a sudden, I find myself walking up and down in front of these people, preaching them from the book of Hebrews on the sufficiency of the death of Christ and the blood of Christ. And he's, he says, it, it really wasn't me. I was too nervous. I was too scared. But I spoke the gospel to these people. And he said, six months later, we go back, because we eventually figured out when the general conference was. And this woman comes up to him, and she's already got her finger up like this. So he's figuring, okay, we know where this is going. But she says, you were here six months ago, weren't you? He goes, yeah. And you were talking about the blood of Christ. Yeah, yeah, I was. Well, I took one of your tracks out of spite. And two months ago, I started reading it just out of spite. And I have come to place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and his finished work in my behalf. That kind of spiritual experience, I can, give, I can tell you my own versions of very similar things that have happened on the same sidewalks in, in Salt Lake City. Um, we tend not to talk about them because you know on TBN, they replace actually preaching the Bible. <laughs> with the constant experience over and over and over again, that type of stuff. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have those spiritual experiences. We just always have to define them and recognize them in light of what Scripture teaches. And um, so, anyways, sorry I went long with you. I didn't mean to keep you on there forever. I no, appreciate your time. God bless you and your ministry. All right, thanks, Nick. God bless. Okay, real quick, uh, let's talk to Ben. Hi, Ben. I think we're going to Luke chapter 16, I'd assume. Hey there, Dr. White. Can you hear me okay? I can. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thanks to Rich in the background as well for everything he does. Uh, big fan of the show. Um, my question 
may or may not be <laughs> all that important, but it's something that I've always been interested in, and I'd love to get your take on it. So my question today has to do with mainly where the Old Testament saints went after they died, but prior to the ascension. Right. Um, now, besides myself and my dad, who also happens to be my pastor, um, I've actually never heard anyone talk about the um, like two compartment reality of Hades until I heard you talking about it on your show um, maybe a few months back or so. And uh, in my area, <laughs> no one believes that. You know, they'll say that the Old Testament saints, they all went to heaven. Um, you know, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, it's just a parable um, and not a true story. Uh, they'll say that Elijah went up, you know, when he was translated. So there's proof that that's where they went. Um, so I, I mainly just wanted to get your thoughts on how that worked, you know, like Abraham's bosom, paradise, Hades and all that kind of stuff. Um, and how you would teach why that reality was necessary to be that way again, prior to the Ascension. Well, uh, Briefly, it, it, it's because it, it the, the Old Testament does not give us nearly the level of um, specificity and clarity that you have in the New. And of course, there's all sorts of variant views, some of which are Orthodox, some of which are not. Uh, there are people who have some really interesting theories out there that they sort of go off, I think, on a few things, but I, I, I don't tend to be super uh, critical on some of these issues. If someone says, yeah, I just don't see it that way, or I don't think you, you can necessarily put that amount of weight on it or s stuff like that. I, I'm like, okay, okay, fine. That, 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 that's okay. But it just seems to me that Paul is making some reference to this when he says Christ led captivity captive that there is something that has changed because of the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, um, that the Old Testament saints are saved in the same way, but there still has to be an accomplishment of that redemptive work in the cross. And the cross is, the cross and the resurrection is the center point of history. And so, um, uh, it's possible that Luke 16, 19 following is a parable, but it would be the only parable in all the Bible that uses a specific name. Um, does, does that prove one way or the other? No, but it is interesting. And mm -hmm. the, the Jews wouldn't have had any problem really understanding the context of what Jesus is uh, presenting here, because during the inter intertestamental period, there there were various understandings, various speculations concerning the nature of life after death. Uh, because again, the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi, and the Ketuvim doesn't give us all that level of clarity. And some of the texts that we cite, we see the clarity only because we have the New Testament looking backwards at it. That That's important to recognize as well. So, um, you you plainly have in Luke chapter sixteen this distinction, this this um, division between uh, where Lazarus is and where the rich man goes, um, and that is reflected later, for example, by Peter when he talks about how God um, knows how to deliver the righteous, but to keep the wicked under punishment for the day of judgment. So there is the idea of a continuing punishment. It's not like, I mean, because it really wouldn't make any sense when you think about it. You are a wicked person. You are going to be judged by God. However, you're going to get a reprieve from the time of your death until uh, that final day of judgment where you're just going to, you're not going to be under judgment at all. Uh, you're going to be good. Uh, maybe not knowing anything is that maybe there's it's a soul sleep idea or something like that but peter says he keeps him under judgment it's it's very clear that that judgment is an ongoing thing 
Now, I think we have to be careful about uh, allowing medieval theologians to fill in a lot of the details as to exactly what this judgment involves. You know, oh, it's it's hellfire, it's burning, it's this, it's that, it's the other thing. I, I think we have to be careful there as to exactly... And I think we have to be careful when we talk about the nature of eternal punishment. Uh, because we have so many, so many traditions that have grown up over time. Rather than going, well, what does Scripture say the nature of that is? And yes, Basanis Moss, torment, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Um, okay, you've, you've got that. Um, but that doesn't tell us anything about the specifics of what the experience is. And I, I think if we if we have a biblical anthropology, uh, I really think that it's much more likely that the nature of, for example, eternal punishment is based upon separation from God. So in other words, mm -hmm. you're an enemy of God, you hate God, you're not going to be around anybody else. People who think there's going to be any parties in hell or something are, are completely wrong. Um, it's called darkness for a reason. And so you're put us in a position where all restraints are removed from your hatred. But you have nothing that represents God to hate except yourself. You bear the image of God. And so I, I think the suffering of the damned is not God sending angels down with pitchforks or any of the Gary Larson cartoons. And there's many, many, many of them out there. Um, I think it is the individual expressing their hatred of the only thing that is um, representative of God in their experience. That's themselves. So I don't think God has to lift a finger. I don't think God is, on the one hand, comforting us at the same time he's sending thunderbolts uh, after somebody else. So those are some things to think about regarding eternal punishment. But um, I, I think what we have to affirm is that that division of the realm of death, Hades, um, doesn't exist any longer because we have the promise in the New Testament that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Now, there's some people who say, well, that's just because you don't experience time, and so you're just going to cease to exist, and then you're going to, uh, or at least be unconscious, and then the next thing you'll know, you're going to be with the Lord. I, I don't think that would have given Paul the confidence at all um, that uh, a recognition of in Christ and therefore in him, in communion with him, as soon as uh, physical death takes place, awaiting that physical resurrection. I don't think that would have given him the kind of uh, comfort that, that I think it really is intended to give. Um, so it would seem that at the resurrection and the victory over the evil one, that uh, bifurcation division of the realm of the dead uh, ends, but it is Hades that is emptied in the judgment and the lake of fire is separate from Hades. It is different. Hades is not Gehenna. They are not, they're not identical to one another. Um, there are certain aspects of these things that we have to stand firm on, and there are other aspects of these things that we have to be very careful about. I, I try to warn people so that they're aware of this. Um, in my experience, the vast majority of New Testament scholars are conditionalists. They're annihilationists. Um, they don't believe in eternal punishment eternal conscious punishment. And a large number of the texts that people use simplistically uh, to present that um, have fairly decent responses from the other side that argue against it. I think the most solid foundation for uh, a orthodox understanding of eternal punishment has to do really with Reformed theology and its understanding of man and the atonement, union with Christ, and what separation from Christ would mean, rather than certain texts that might make reference to this or might re make reference to that. That's a huge area. I have, I have said to folks um, that, you know, there are, there are certain people that 
um, we can learn much from. Uh, Stott, for example, was a conditionalist, and yet he wrote some great stuff. Now, there were early church writers that were universalists, and that ended up impacting everything they, they believed about the gospel. Um, so, we have to be, I, I, I really think we have to be careful as to how we deal with this, because the vast majority of Christians just simply take it as a given and, and have never actually had to listen to and deal with the people on the other side. They're, they're, they've got a lot more arguments than people think they do. So, yeah. Anyways, I'm not sure if that had anything to do with what you're saying, but, um, well, no, that is all uh, incredibly uh, interesting and helpful. Um, the annihilationist view is somewhat, as you, to prove your point, is somewhat new to me personally, um, something that I stumbled across um, in just digging into some, um, well, some of your recent um, shows, um, as well as looking into it a little bit after kind of getting that initial prompt. And and I would also agree as far as the distinction between the eternal state uh, of hell and and Hades as it currently exists. Um, I guess one of the reasons why I do think um, the, the concept of Abraham's bosom, this place um, in the same area where the, let's just say the bad side of Hades resides, why that's in, important is because to me, I'm thinking, you know, where, you know, where, where did Jesus go? Uh, right in between the death and well, the ascension. The problem um, there, though, the problem there, though, uh, that raises the issue of um, defining Tartarus. Mm -hmm. Who are the spirits that Christ makes proclamation to? What right. does it mean to well, make proclamation? Um, yes. that, that gets you into a world of trouble. Uh, it really, and, really does. Well, and, and I, I would 100% agree with that. And, and perhaps my argument for that would not be, um, would be far too simplistic to actually take to a, a deeper conversation about it against someone that was opposing it. But in my mind, that passage of First Peter, which is just very, very fascinating to me, yeah. is that it doesn't necessarily negate um, that Jesus could have been on the good side of of Hades, in other words, in Abraham's bosom, because we know from that Luke 16 passage that there is a gulf separating the two and that Abraham could speak to the rich man across it. Yeah. And so I always thought, well, perhaps Jesus's preaching was taking place on a, or in Abraham's bosom, but could be heard, assuming that those spirits are bad spirits right. on the other side. But yeah. again... Peter seems Maybe to have too much speculation. Yeah, it is. It is speculation. It just seems to me that Peter seems to have a specific group of spirits in mind that engage in a specific activity and that are uh, imprisoned in a very specific place. Um, mm -hmm. It could be. I'm not saying. I'm not saying I would necessarily argue the point, but it. That's just how I've always. I've always looked at it. But it is a very complex and challenging thing, and that's why I think we have to be. Sure. Uh, somewhat uh, careful about how quickly we swing the theological sword, shall we say, and lop mm -hmm. somebody's head off. So, well, that's all super helpful, worth. Dr. White. Thank you so much for your for your time today. Thank um, you very much. God bless. Okay, Rich. I think looking at the time, the best we're going to be able to do is to get to Chris and Brenda. So, Mike and Joseph, keep those questions warm, and uh, we'll try to do this again. We did this only a few weeks ago, so. We're, we're doing this a little bit more often. And we probably should find a way to do this when I'm on the road. Um, <laughs> yes. So get that done. Let it be said. Let it be done. <laughs> Make it so. Make it so. Uh, engage. Uh, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> it, 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 it can be done. Uh, I'm sure it, it, it can be done. All right, so let's uh, let's get Chris and Brenda, and uh, we're going to be out of time by that point. Uh, Chris, uh, Doctor White, can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. Um, so uh, last time I asked you the, this question, this is a follow up question. Uh, the the context is 
that thelema is the noun and thalo is the verb. And when when you ask most people in the West, they would say that they wish or desire or want many things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will do these things. And in, in the Bible, uh, we have this word thalo, but it's often translated now in our Bibles uh, as wishing, wanting, uh, and uh, sometimes willing, willing, but often, but often desiring, willing, and, and wishing. And I was just wondering if you think that that those words are sufficient substitutes or synonyms for willing. Well, it obviously it depends on, you know, th- this is. I mentioned in my response to Trent Horn that you have something called semantic domains. And uh, the study of semantic domains, you look at a word, you look at its uses, and you determine the parameters of um, the meaning of the term. Some have a very narrow semantic domain, which means they're very technical. So operabaton in Hebrews 7 has a very technical meaning to it. It can't apply to a wide variety of things. But thelo can be used verbally, thelema as a substantive, um, in, a, in, a, in a number, it, it can be used in indicatively, subjunctively, optatively. These are different ways that the, the, the Greek language expresses the nature of the action. And so there can be a, a wished for result where you actually can express it in such a way as I wish it would happen this way, but it's probably not. It's unlikely. Um, or I, I will this to happen and it's, it's likely going to happen. There's an, there's ways of doing that. So the point is that you can by the context of the language, um, point to the specific area of the semantic domain of the meaning of the term. Um, and, and communicate that in, in, in your writing. So if, if Paul says, I desire you to bring me something, Timothy, that's different than if he's talking about um, God's desire um, to glorify himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Very, very different contexts. And so you can't just uh, say, well, since Thelo means this, in this context, that it means this in this context too. That that is an abuse of of language. So, um, there are strong uses of 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 thelo. God God wills to do something, and the thelema um, connecting with bulamai. There's there's some there's some uh, synonyms that are frequently used according to the counsel of His will. Well, sometimes counsel is just used of itself or wills just used of itself. So when you put them together, that can also impact where the meaning falls as well. So it, um, you, you have to, you'd have to be looking at a specific usage to get any more specific than that. Okay. So you're saying that there's something within the sentence or the surrounding syntax that tells us what thelo means that tells us what part of the semantic domain of thelo uh is being emphasized by the author yes or okay or if it's an obscure passage uh we were talking about an obscure passage earlier in first corinthians chapter 11 you know kephale head uh can have different meanings a uh, part of its semantic domain is the physical head of a human being. But when it says Christ is the head of every man, that's a different meaning. That's a different area of its of its meaning. And so um, th- it's not, I'm not saying that there's going to be a guarantee that the usage is going to clarify, uh, but in the vast majority of instances, it does. Okay, because the only reason why I ask is because the older Bibles lean 
more into uh, translating it as will, willing, or would. And the newer translations have this um, wider dy dy dynamic semantic domain. It just seems confusing to me that a word would be used that is that has that wide of a semantic domain. It's almost like a a, 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 a gibberish kind of word. Well, logos, logos has a wide semantic domain, and yet uh, the Spirit of God used it in John 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning was the Logos. And that has led to arguments and debates, um, but that was the word the Spirit chose to use. So, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm not really aware of a major argument uh, or debate over the meaning of Thelo. I would imagine that the majority of the differences with more modern translations is more to do with current English style than it is anything else and attempting to accurately represent differences between the indicative, subjunctive, optative um, of, in, in, in the original languages. So you get into the, the justive and things like that in the Old Testament uh, with similar... There's there's similar issues regarding Hebrew words expressing mm -hmm. the same concept. So, um, yeah, it's it it can be it can be um, a, a challenge, um, but normally the context provides you with sufficient um, to be able to make a determination as to whether we're just talking about something that I want to have happen or that something that is being willed to happen. Uh, normally, the context does provide you with sufficient information there. I uh, I, I I love that uh, you've given me this answer, and thank you. Um, I, I really I know I'm asking for too much, but I would really like to see that actually broken down sometime because to me it's a big deal about well, do am I just wishing something? Am I just fancying something, or is it this, or is this something that I I should will to do? So. If if that's something that perhaps maybe one day you could you could show on the big board or something, I'd really appreciate uh, showing how the the uh, context of a sentence can 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 obviously show that it means either wish or wanting. Okay, all right, Chris, I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, bye bye. All right, real quick, Brenda. Hello, Brenda. No, Brenda? Hi, Dr. White. Can, can you hear me? I can now. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, it's a thrill for me to be talking with you, but I won't spend too much time fangirling over you. Um, my question is kind of twofold. Uh, we know that when Christ died on the cross, that he... He, all of the sins of the elect were imputed to him. So that then when the elect expressed their faith in Christ, then his righteousness is imputed to us and we're justified and in good standing with God. And then he won't bring a charge against us for any sins. Our sins are forgiven past, present, and future. However, in, uh, john's first epistle he talks about how uh true believers don't practice sin but of course we're going to sin and then in uh 1 9 he says if we confess our sins he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness so someone could uh interpret that as meaning like a conditional thing like if we want our sins forgiven after we're justified, then we have to confess our sins. So I need some clarification with that. And then the other part of that on top of that is uh, about the Lord's Supper. And I know somebody, a, a Bible teacher that is a Roman Catholic. Uh, he wasn't Roman Catholic, but converted to Christianity. And he's definitely a Christian. Uh, but his take because of first Corinthians 11 is that when we go to uh, take the Lord's Supper, that we have to be sure that we confess our sins and that we're cleansed before we do that. So that sort of is the whole thing in a nutshell. 
Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, fundamentally, the the issue that you're you're touching upon here is um, the positional and the experiential aspects of sanctification. So, in other words, we recognize the foundation of our relationship with God is the imputed righteousness of Christ, and that all of the writings which were against us have been taken away and nailed to the cross. But as 1 John says, there is the experience of what that means in light of the fact that God leaves us in this world and that we experience um, sin, we experience failure, we are not perfected in our understanding uh, and in our experience until... uh, until... God brings us home to himself. And so there is the need for the experience of forgiveness when we experience the conviction of the Spirit of God regarding our sin. And so it's not that the that Christ is resacrificed or that the initial cleansing was insufficient, but we ourselves experience that failure and the Spirit of God within us causes us to hate our sin. Uh, we don't want to live in that way, and therefore, um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It is, a, it is conditional. If we don't confess, um, then the Spirit of God's not active in our lives. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, well, either or. It's one is the experience, the other is the reality that gives shape to that experience. If you don't recognize the finished work of Christ, and the fact that we were united with him, then you'll end up with some kind of sacramental system where you're constantly running around, you never have peace, um, and you're constantly trying to fulfill some system that you'll never really be able to to accomplish. And that's what you got in Roman Catholicism. So, and in a lot of Protestant denominations too, sadly, you have the same thing. Um, and so in the same way, what Paul is addressing with the Corinthians in regards to the supper um, is a fundamental failure in the fellowship of the uh, Corinthian church to where you don't have any uh, reflection as to what the sacrifice of Christ means in the sense that it creates the body of Christ. You are just looking at yourself uh, some people, you know, eat gluttonously. They don't care about the poor, um, and and by not being concerned about others, you're not even giving thought to the fact that it is the single sacrifice of Christ that unites all of us. That's the only reason that there is any unity in the body, is that it's one sacrifice of Christ. It's one righteousness of Christ. If you don't have an imputed righteousness uh, being given. I don't know how, for example, Rome, which has no imputed righteousness, can provide a meaningful foundation for unity in the church. That's why they they do it in regards to your your submission to the Pope, rather than the unity we have as being uh, recipients of the righteousness of Christ. And therefore, I have no basis for looking down on someone else because my standing before God the Father and their standing before God the Father is identical. So, um, but what you have in, in, in the supper uh, is Paul correcting this um, haphazard celebration that leaves the poor out and, and, and isn't focused upon why Christ gave us the supper in, supper in the first place. And that was as a, an anamnesis. A, when, when Christ says, do this in remembrance of me, anamnesis, under the Old Covenant, you had a remembrance of sin because it had to be repeated over and over again. Under the New Covenant, we have a remembrance of the sin bearer. And so when we do the supper each week, we are not um, re-sacrificing Christ. We are not doing something we need to do to prop all of that back up again. We are remembering the singular sacrifice, the hapax sacrifice, of Christ, and the way that the Corinthians had begun to do this was 
diminishing that and obscuring that um and wasn't and as a result it didn't bring about the unity that the supper properly celebrated brings because there's we're all partaking of one bread we're drinking of one cup um there's not certain people who get more and certain people who get less and certain people do it this time certain people at that time we're all together it's a common confession and um uh so when it when we when we when you speak of the unworthiness there in first corinthians it has to do with the divisions in the church um it's not you know we are obviously to take it very seriously and that there is to be self reflection but the focus to be is to be on christ and not some secondary or tertiary experience of resalvation or navel gazing i mean sadly uh, i've only been to the netherlands once and i'll never get to go again now but one of the things that was expressed to me when i was there amongst the reformed was that many of the reformed would not partake of the lord's supper because they did not feel worthy they they had a basically a context of a, con, a concept of sinless perfectionism required to partake of the supper. And I just thought that was tragic. Uh, the supper is one of the greatest means of grace the Lord has given to us. And so to purposefully not partake of it because I don't feel worthy enough. Well, you're not, you're never going to be worthy. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the whole point. He's the one who's worthy, not us. Um, but so there can be a scrupulous scrupul, scrupulosity. Um, Maybe that's a new word I just made up uh, that keeps people from uh, partaking because of that. And that, that, that needs to be uh, warned against as, as well. So um, there you go. I, I think it's just simply the experience, our ongoing experience in life of sanctification that's based upon the recognition of the reality of the perfection of the work of Christ. But we still live in this life and therefore... We need to experience that forgiveness. Um, it's really where the eternal and the temporal butt up against each other. And we're still in the temporal. We're still in the time bound. We're, we see the eternal reality, but that time boundedness means we need to experience that forgiveness on a regular basis, which we do when we confess our sins and, and can trust in that forgiveness because it has been provided in Christ. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Brenda. Appreciate it. All right, we went a lot longer than I thought we were going to go today, but uh, Mike, we'll get we'll get back to that one, and Joseph uh, as well. Thank you for your your calls today. And uh, this is Thursday. Yes. Okay. Um, real quick here, I think uh, they're coming up real fast. So next week should be fairly straightforward i'm looking at an old style calendar hanging on the wall look at that um and uh then the next week is when everything will go uh bonkers and for example i know that i'll be leaving i believe on a tuesday yes i will so probably we'll do something on that monday but i know that that tuesday um we're literally doing a pastoral meeting that I'll be Zooming or whatever we use uh, in for when I get to Albuquerque. I'm sorry, to Holbrook. And then on the 6th, the next day, I'm doing Iron Sharpens Iron with uh, Chris Arnson. So it could be a Monday, Thursday type of situation, something along those lines. Um, but we will obviously use the app to let you know that uh, we're, on, we're on the road. And uh, we'll let you know when we're going to be able to do things or when we have to move stuff, whatever it might be. Um, and um, we'll go from there. So uh, once again, uh, the travel fund at AOMIN.org, that's how we uh, pay for that. Did you know diesel fuel is green? Yeah, it's green. Um, uh, and it's now costing $4.49 per gallon. Thank you, Joe Biden, once again. Um but uh, for the fuel and uh, the RV parks, I stay in only the best. <laughs> uh, 
actually, I know I'm normally a KOA, um, and uh, uh, that's that's how we do it. But um, and man, I I go to all the fancy restaurants. No, I don't. Uh, I, I I I will normally make like a, a turkey sandwich to have in my little cooler while I'm driving, um, and um, uh, the kind folks. Um, at Carolinas, give me a wonderful. In fact, I you, you got to remind me. I need to send a I need to send a text um, about the next upcoming trip because um, they give me wonderful machaca chimichangas to eat on the way. But we ain't we we ain't spending big bucks along those lines. But we need your support along along that way, um, and uh, I appreciate uh, your uh, you're doing that. So. Uh, one more week of regular stuff and then things get disrupted uh please be praying for the debate with gregory coles um the more i'm prepping for this oh the music's already playing great the more i'm prepping for this the more i realize how challenging this is going to be so please pray for that debate uh that uh, god will see fit to bless we'll see you next time